All right. Good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen and amen. Sweet time in the Lord's presence today. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray as we get into this this morning. Father, we just want to thank you again for your faithfulness, your goodness, your love, your grace, your mercy. Father, as we look into your word, I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you want to say to us, Father. And, uh, and, we just, and give us the grace to act upon it, Father. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. We just declare the blood of Jesus over this place, uh, removing any distraction, uh, any interference in Jesus' name, and that you are able to do what you want to do today. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you for a few minutes this morning about something that God gave me this week. Very specific. I mean, there's times when, I mean, you know the Lord has given you a word to share. But then there's just times that you just know that you know. And this is one of those you know that you know days for me. Uh, as I share this, uh, this message, it's part nine in this series called The Rest of Your Life. And today I want to share with you about killing the grasshopper, killing the grasshopper. And I want to share with you an amazing story found in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. I'm going to read this in the New King James Version, which I don't often do. I love the King James. It's just a New King James, not as easy to read uh, sometimes, but I want to read it in this version uh, for a particular reason, beginning in verse number uh 14, Mark chapter 9, verse number 14, it says this, and when he, notice that he is capitalized, that's Jesus, when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around him and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when he saw them, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him and asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? So Jesus is knowing, uh, noticing this commotion, like uh, there's a scene happening as Jesus walks up. And so he's asking, hey, what's going on here? Then one of the crowd, one in the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who was uh, of a mute spirit. And wherever he, it, it seizes him and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. So they brought this little boy, this young boy, to Jesus. And when he saw him, when he saw him, that the he is the little he, when the boy saw him, Jesus, when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And he, Jesus, asked the father, how long has, he been, has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you, he's speaking to Jesus, he said, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Desperate situation. This man's son, as you see here, he is, he is vexed. One translation gives the diagnosis to this and calls it epilepsy. Uh, not, not even a translation, one of the books of the Bible. This, this story is recorded in Matthew and Mark, uh, and I believe it's Matthew's version that actually says what it is that it's epilepsy, and this is the, the, the result of it. He goes into convulsions. Um, but it's also, although it has a diagnosis, there's a recognition that there's a spirit involved. Now, now listen, I'm all about medical care. I think it's wonderful, right? I've, I've been the fruit of it, right? But you know what? Sometimes the enemy oppresses us with, with sickness and disease and things that go beyond just pure medical, sheer medical uh, uh, wisdom and knowledge. And this was obviously the case in the case of this little boy. So the dad is desperate. And he says to Jesus, if you can help us, please do. And again, here's Jesus' response. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. 
Don't you know this seemed like an impossibility for this man? This, this had been happening. This didn't just start happening the week before or a couple of days before. This had been happening all of this young boy's life. So listen, it just makes sense that there's some weakness in belief in this man, this father, and, and, and he's, he's, he's doing the right things. He's going to the right place. He's seeking out Jesus. I'm sure he's tried everything else. And Jesus responds. It's like Jesus just sends a direct missile right into the heart of this man. And as this man says, if you can help us, please do. Jesus says, if you can believe. All things are possible to him who believes. Like This isn't just a statement. Jesus right here is operating in one of the gifts of the Spirit, which is called the word of knowledge. And and he recognizes through the Holy Spirit that this man has a belief problem. And he speaks to it. He addresses it right here. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears. So Jesus has this word of knowledge. And he says, hey, if you can believe Anything is possible to him that believes. And so the man cries out with tears. He cries out and he says with tears, Lord, I believe. You could, you could even say it this way, Lord, I do believe. But help my unbelief. King James says, this is new King James. The King James says, but help thou my unbelief. Wow. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead. The boy appeared dead, so that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately. When he, this is Jesus, when Jesus had come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? I like their question. First of all, there's an assumption that they can cast out the devil, right? You know how foreign that is to most people in the church today? I mean, we're in denial that there is a devil most often and that there's, there's demonization. Demonization is when someone is vexed by an unclean spirit, and it can take on different forms. And the devil don't care because as long as we deny his existence, we can never take, take authority over it. And, and so I love the fact that they're saying, hey, we ought to be able to do this. Like, we've done this before. You sent us out, Jesus. Uh, you sent out 12 of us, and you sent out 70 of us, and we know how to cast the devil out of somebody. Why couldn't we do it right here? Here's what he said. And when they came to the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this is what he said, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. This kind. See, this is a different kind. He's, what he's telling them is this. Listen, hey, this ain't like the other kind. This is a different kind. This is a different kind of spirit. And this kind... This kind of spirit can only come out through prayer and through fasting. Isn't that interesting? I love the honesty of this man because I feel like it's where a lot of us can be at times in our lives. And here's where this is. You ready? This struggle between belief and unbelief. This man said, Lord, I do believe. I believe. But help my unbelief. But help my unbelief. And, and you would think, okay, man, how can that be possible? How can that be possible? Uh, here's, here's what I see. Here, here's what the Lord showed me with this. Uh, Macy mentioned the word sozo. You hear it all the time here. Sozo is the Greek word for saved. And when you combine the Greek word for saved, which is sozo, with the Greek word for salvation, which is soteria, and you write down every meaning, there's seven that you'll see. And so this meaning of saved and salvation, salvation is just the adjective and adverb form of saved. And when you write down the whole meaning, you get seven meanings. It means to be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole, right? And the first word saved really denotes being saved from. So if you were drowning in the river and someone threw you a lifeline, they threw you a life ring with a rope and you grabbed a hold of it, and they pulled you to shore, they just saved you from death and from drowning and dying, right? That's simple, right? 
But in that same process, you were saved from something. You were all saved, also saved to something. You were saved from the depths of the water and drowning, and you were saved to the shore where you now live and can live the rest of your life. So in reality, listen, it's impossible to be saved, to be saved from without also being saved to. And much of, of the church, we focused on the being saved from. It's like we just talk all the time about, hey, you need to be saved from hell. You need to be saved from your sins. You need to be forgiven. And you need to, uh, you need to do this and you need to do that, right? And I grew up in a church world where that was pretty much what we heard. And I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and we pretty much heard that most every service, particularly Sunday morning and Sunday night. And Wednesday night was oftentimes full of law stuff. This is what you don't need to do. This is what you don't need to do. But, but we didn't really talk about the rest of the meanings of sozo salvation because we didn't know them. And, and here's why we didn't know them. We didn't know them because we assumed that salvation meant what we'd been told. And what we're basically doing is we're following the traditions of men. And Jesus said this. He said the traditions of men will make God's word of no effect. When we follow the traditions of men, and this is a tradition is something that's handed down to you, handed down to you, and handed down to you, you can end up putting more value on that than you can God's word. And these, this is what Jesus said. And listen, that's a travesty. Like we're doing ourselves such an injustice when we elevate something someone's told us, and maybe you've heard that your whole life. Well, just because you hold, heard that your whole life doesn't mean it's true, and it doesn't mean it's the whole story and the whole counsel of God. So Peter told us, he said, hey, you study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you know how you got how easy it is to find out what this sozo word means? You just need to look it up. Like, it's there everywhere. It's there everywhere. I mean, when you look up the word saved in the, in the concordance, you look it up in the original language, Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek. If you want to know what any word means, you got to look it up in this original language. And when you do, you're going to see that word there. And every time the word saved is used in the New Testament, it is that word sozo. And not only is it there every time uh, when you see the word saved, but Jesus used this word sozo interchangeably. When the woman who'd been sick for 12 years touched his garment, he said, daughter, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. That Greek word whole was sozo, right? Why did she need that? She just came for healing. Why did she need sozo? Well, she needed healing. She'd been sick for 12 years, but the Bible also told, tells us that she'd spent all she had on doctors seeking a cure and was bankrupt. So she needed more than just a healing in her body. She needed completeness. And she needed completeness. Uh, Jesus told blind uh, Bartimaeus, go your way, your faith has made you whole. That's the word sozo. He told the, the, the one leper out of ten that came back to thank him for the healing. He said, go your way, your faith has made you whole. That's the word sozo. So we see it interchangeably in Scripture, and it's all throughout, right? Now, again, some of you are like, man, this is news to me. I've heard this for the whole five years I've been going to this church. Praise God. Amen, right? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. I bask on this all the time. I eat from that all the time, right? Like the gospel should never get old to you. You should never be like with the gospel. I've heard that. Let's move on. Like it should be something that you're excited to open every time you see it in Jesus' name. Amen? That's how he wants us to look at it, right? And, and, and he, I would dare say this. Listen, particularly for those of you who have heard this message and what I call the full gospel, that's the full gospel. Many of you could say that you have believed. You have believed. And when you think about these seven components of salvation, saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole, most of us could say that, you know what? By and large, for the majority of, of those seven components, I believe and I've received those in my life. But you could also at the same time say, but if I'm being honest, like this man was being honest, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief, because there's an area or two in my life that I've not received yet, and yet I still want it. I believe, I believe you've said this, so I believe it's for me, but for some reason, something's causing this unbelief in my life. Now, let's look at the word belief and unbelief. You ready for this? You got to look at this word, and so I look up the word believe in the New Testament. It's the Greek word pisteo. And it means this. The word believe means this. It means commit unto. It means be put in trust with. To commit to one's trust. 
to think to be true, to be persuaded of. You know what it means to be persuaded? When you're persuaded of something, you can't doubt because you're persuaded. When you're persuaded of something, someone can't convince you otherwise because you're persuaded. You've already been persuaded. Listen, here's what it means too. It means to credit, to place confidence in, mere acknowledgement of some fact or event. It means it's happened. Like this is factual. This has happened. Intellectual faith. And really you could take that word intellectual faith and means I conceive it like like. I believe it in my heart, but it's also gone to my mind. Do I really logically, analytically believe that this is true? And it ends with to be entrusted with a thing, to be entrusted. Paul talks about that we hold within us this treasure, that God has placed his treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure is his good news. It's this abundant life, right? And he's given it to us in these earthen vessels. And you know what he's done with the good news? Listen, he's entrusted us with it. And here's the thing, to be entrusted with something means you have to receive it. You have to, at some point in your life, receive it, be convinced of it, and walk in it. Are you with me so far? Some of you know that Scott is is a couple of years away from retiring with the Highway Patrol here in North Carolina. He's a first sergeant. His district is in Wilson and Greene County. And uh, and I, I've, I've met Scott as a chaplain with the Highway Patrol. and. Uh, and there's a whole story with that. But but Scott would tell you today, listen to this, he supervises troopers, right? Uh, he probably hadn't written a ticket himself in a very long time, but he just makes sure that the other guys are doing that, right, in his district, right? But but And, and Scott, through the years, has had, uh, we call them, they're called rookies. They're rookies, and they're, 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 they're right out of patrol school. That patrol school is six months long. It is one of the hardest law enforcement schools you can go through. And the state of North Carolina spends thousands of dollars to train and equip a potential trooper. At one time, I heard the numbers, it was well over $100,000. Room and board, food, the training, uh, the vehicle, the equipment, the uniforms, everything that goes into that training, right? They spend 13 weeks of training, at, excuse me, not 30, uh, uh, six months of training at the school. But then when they get assigned to their district, they spend several more months, a few more months, with a, a, a FTO, that's called a field training officer. It's a more senior trooper, and they ride with that trooper at first, and then the trooper's riding with them. And that trooper there is actually training them in the field to do the work that they're called to do, right? Now, listen, I've been to a graduation for these guys, and it's really awesome to see. Uh, they're all gathered together, and they're finally, they, they, they're get, they take the oath. They got their hand on the Bible, and they take the oath, and they're sworn in as troopers for the state of North Carolina, and they've got their badges on, and boom, at that point, it's, it's, they're, they're troopers. Isn't that interesting? But, but listen, okay, what would happen if one of these rookies, these young rookies, he, rookies he's, he's gone through a six months, he's gone through his FTO training, and then and, and he just comes in the office one day, and he says to Scott, said, First Sergeant, said, I, I just got to be honest with you. Like, uh, I know I'm a trooper, but... Uh, I just don't. I just don't feel like I, I have the authority to write a ticket to somebody. Like, who am I? Like, who am I to get out there and stop traffic in the road when it needs to be stopped? I, I don't feel like I need. I have the authority to investigate an accident or enforce the laws uh, of North Carolina. And, and and like, I like this uniform, and I like this car, and I like the paycheck that I'm getting. But for, I just don't feel. I just don't feel worthy. Nobody in my family was in law enforcement. I don't have a history of this, and I don't feel worthy, right? Well, he would get a good talking to by his first sergeant, <laughs> a real good talking to, right? And, and he's already in a probationary period as a young trooper. You know what would happen after that probationary period if at some point something hadn't clicked in his heart and mind? Listen, and he had taken within him what he had been entrusted with. You know, you know what would happen? Here's what would happen. Despite all the investment the state of North Carolina had made in that young man's life or that young lady's life, they'd be let go. Why? Because they'd never allowed themselves to entrust, to be entrusted with the responsibility and the duties they had been assigned with. You with me? And this is the best way I can illustrate this. This is, un- listen, this is belief. Belief says, I'm going to take what's been entrusted to me. Isn't that interesting? 
Do you know that the children of Israel are pretty much called the children of Israel until they take the promised land? Coming in, in Egypt, coming out of Egypt, living 40 years in the wilderness, coming to the edge of the Jordan River, they're referred to in Scripture as the children of Israel. You know what children are doing? They're growing up. And the fact that you're still a child means you haven't grown up yet, right? And it's not until they get into the promised land that they become known as the nation of Israel. Wow. In the new covenant, here's what God wants for you and me. He wants us to be, become sons and daughters of the Most High God. In fact, there's a New Testament scripture that says all of creation is groaning for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Which means believers stepping into what we've been given and entrusted with as believers in Jesus Christ. See, listen, the world has a need, not for religious people, but the world has a need for sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen. And sons and daughters denote maturity. They denote believers who have received what they've been entrusted with. Amen? Now listen, if you could say, hey, of all those seven areas that Sozo represents, I could tell you I've received five of them. There's a couple of them that I haven't quite received yet. Then you want to ask yourself, what's causing that unbelief? Unbelief, right? Here's the word unbelief. Apostia is the word unbelief. So you got belief and then you got unbelief. The word apostia means unfaithfulness. Do you know what they would say to that trooper? Hey, my friend. Hey, young man. You are being unfaithful in the execution of your duties. Isn't that interesting? Uh, a commanding officer. We've had more military commanders relieved over the last year or two than ever at one time in our history. And they've been found as uh, they've lost faith and confidence in their ability to command. And they, they've just, they've, they've gotten fired. They've gotten let go. There's been a cleaning out that's happened, right? Listen to this. When you don't walk in what God has given you, you're unfaithful. We're unfaithful. We're, we're, we're walking in unfaithfulness when we're not embracing uh, and taking what's been committed to us. Listen, here's it, apostia. It means unbelief. This is unbelief. The want in faith means that we're lacking faith. Or positively, unfaithfulness. And here's another word. You ready? And I know this may sound harsh, but this is what, this is what the word defined, okay? It means disobedience. Wow. You mean unbelief is disobedience? According to God's word, it is. Whoa. Disobedience shown in withholding, and here's how it manifests. It's disobedience shown in withholding belief in the divine power. Littleness of faith, little faith, that's unbelief. Now, I just got to be honest with you. When it comes to belief and unbelief, I think this is serious to God. Like, this is a big deal to him. And, and, and as, Jesus, as Jesus is dealing with this situation, Here's what he's dealing with. This man's unbelief, this father's unbelief that even the disciples couldn't cast the devil out of that little boy and it took Jesus in the moment to bring deliverance to that boy. Here's what I believe. God wants to deal with any unbelief in our life so that we walk in the fullness of what God has for us. Amen? The fullness. The Lord gave me this this week. Listen to this. The children of Israel's unbelief kept them from entering into the promised land. Now, here's how we know. We know because they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And these were their words. They said, they said hey, we, there are giants in the land, and we look like grasshoppers compared to them, and we feel like grasshoppers ourselves. We see ourselves as grasshoppers. And because of this grasshopper mentality, they refused to go into the promised land. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Now, I'm just going to be really raw with you and real for the next few moments. Because I had a, some time with the Lord this week where he showed me some grasshopper areas in my life. I just want to be honest with you. Listen, we as preachers have got to get over trying to make everybody think we've got it all together and that you're the only one with the problem or the issue. 
Amen. We're all made out of flesh and blood. Amen. And so I'm going to tell you my own personal story this morning because I'm hoping it'll help somebody. This week, the Lord says to me, here's what he said to me. He said this to me. He said, you have faith to come out, but you don't have the faith to go in. You believe, but your unbelief is keeping you from receiving. He said this to me this week. My wife and I just had one of those come home to Jesus talks on Wednesday about some things, right? And I'll just be honest with you. It was about some things concerning finances, right? And just like our finances, like we just felt we, we were feeling this pressure. Many of you know I operate a Christian radio station in this area. I w- I've been feeling pressure there. Uh, I, can I just be honest with you? We felt it from the church. This is why I'm taking time to share with you faith stories because I'm just being honest. I don't keep up with who gives and who gives what, but you know our giving has gone down here substantially in our church. Listen, we had double and almost triple the size of people at Redmond Lodge, and our giving was two or, th- two or three times what it is right now. And, and now I know the economy stuff. I go, you go to the grocery store, and it's, it's real, right? Listen, but here's what's happened. People of God, and this isn't just our church. I've, I've done some checking. This is happening in the body of Christ. People have stopped giving. They're going, they're, listen, listen, and the last thing you want to do is stop putting God first in your giving. You, you can't do that. That's the last thing you can do. But here, you know what happens? It's oftentimes the first thing we do. And you know what causes us to do that? Can I just be honest with you? It's our unbelief. We believe, but yet I go to the grocery store and I know what I got coming next week, and, and my unbelief kicks in. I'm just being honest with you. Let's get real, amen? And so we're having a conversation Wednesday about this. And I didn't want to hear this. I didn't want to have this conversation. I was resistant, but I had it. And in having this conversation, the Lord just spoke to me. And he said, listen, you don't have a problem giving. You have a problem receiving. You don't have a giving problem. You have a receiving problem. I love to give. And there's times I just will give the shirt off my back. And I'm not saying that as a boast, right? I don't have a problem with give. God delivered me of the spirit of not giving. But here's where I struggle. And I'm just being honest with you. I struggle in receiving. And my struggle to receive is not from a pride perspective, listen, but I often lack the belief to receive from God. And so this this just sent me into a tailspin. From Wednesday evening, Thursday, Friday, I'm like, God, this, this isn't right. And I want to get to the bottom of it. And I'm asking you to show me What is going on in my life that's keeping me from being able to receive the abundant blessing and provision you have for me? I should not be lacking. It shouldn't be too tight for me to operate this or operate that. And so, Lord, if there's some unbelief, I believe, but if there's some unbelief in me that's holding me back, that's created this ceiling that I can't get above, I'm asking you to show me exactly what it is. And I can't tell you today that I have all the answers, but I do believe I've had breakthrough. I believe I've had breakthrough. Here's what I did. I just got radical. I just said, Lord, I'm going to fast. I'm going to seek you. And fasting means I pushed away from food, and I pushed away from stuff. And I said, Lord, I want to get along with you. And just, I've got to hear from you in this area. This has got to be broken in my life. And I'm, I'm just on the Internet. I'm looking like, where can I go? Like, you know, I... Is there a cabin somewhere? I didn't want to go to a hotel. Uh, I, don't want, I didn't want to go around people. I just want to get somewhere alone from God and just get somewhere I could go. So I'm looking, and just nothing was working. Nothing was popping up. Nothing was working. And so I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, just go to the building. Go to the building. So I came up here Thursday afternoon late, and I ended up sleeping in this building. I, I slept a couple, I, right, right where Will and Faith sleep. And I, uh, or sit, that's where I slept right there, right? I got me out of pillow, and I just, I just, I, I dived into, I just separated myself, and I dived into the Word and in prayer. And I'm like, Lord, you got to show me what is this? And he began to show me some stuff. And, and, and it's so interesting. I just want to share what he showed, showed me. Can I share it with you? He, he showed me, he, and I don't have all the details. But I got enough to know. I got enough to know. I had a guy reach out to me a few years ago. His name's Donnie, and he lives in Ohio. 
And he said, hey, I'm your fourth cousin twice removed. I don't even know what that means, right? We don't have the same last name, right? We don't even have a family resemblance. He said, but on my mother's side, I'm related to your family. And, and he starts sending me pictures and history of my family through Facebook Messenger. And I'm like, dude, you, you, you got our family down. He's telling me about my dad. He's telling me about my He said, I've done family research, and, I'm just, and I've got a few questions, and I want you to help me if you could uh, connect in some dots. And I said, certainly. I'd be glad to, right? And so we've had this ongoing conversation now for a few years now. But Donnie sent me this one picture. So throw up the first picture, if you will. Donnie sent me this picture right here, and this is my great-grandfather. His name was John Washington Jones. And I asked my mom, I clarified this week. I said, Mom, who was I named after? He said, well, John comes from your great-grandfather, and my name is John Edward Jones. And he said, Edward comes from my dad. I said, okay, well, that, I mean, I've kind of known that, but I didn't really know that for sure. I knew the Edward part, but I wasn't sure about John. And, uh, and so I was named after this man right here, okay? He's my great-grandfather. This picture was taken somewhere around 1927, okay? And it's been colorized, okay? But here's what Donnie told me. Here's what Donnie told me. He said, listen, man, your grandfather was a prominent farmer around Aden. Pro I mean, he had acres. He was, a, he was a wealthy farmer. He had wealth. He was a prominent farmer around Aden, and he had great influence in that whole community. I said, wow, that's incredible. Okay, wow. And then I'm looking, and he's telling me who these uh, sons are. But then I notice in the picture that my grandfather is missing from the photo. My grandfather was named Lewis Jones on my dad's side. And at this time, from what we can tell, he was off serving in the Army, and he was stationed somewhere in New York around this time, right? Like, wow. And they had one sister, and her name is Maybell. May, right here. May Bell is her name, right? Now, throw the next picture up, if you will. And this is my grandfather. Now, this is later on in years, and this is my dad. He was the youngest of six, and the, the second to the youngest was this, this one right here to the right named Mac. So Steve and Mac were the youngest, right? And there was a big age gap. They had six children. My, my grandmother and my grandfather had six kids. And honestly, my, my, my uncle, my oldest uncle, J.C., uh, he was around 18 or 19 years old when my dad was about six years old and my uncle J.C. left the home to go start his life and his, his, his career, right? And he went in the Navy, and from the Navy, he went in the Air Force. He became a fighter pilot and had a successful career. But then flip to that next picture, if you will. But here's the fruit of, 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 here's the fruit of, uh, of, of Lewis's life. Here's Lewis right here. And Lewis is holding two babies, and I'm the one in the right. On the right, I'm a year old. So this was taken around 1968, and my cousin Wendy was right there in his other arm. And here's what I knew about Lewis Jones. He was a good man and loved his – my Aunt Sybil, she's over here somewhere. Aunt Sybil's right up here. Aunt Sybil told me uh, – we went to – I took her and my other aunt to, to, to my Uncle JC's, the oldest, 90th birthday. And here's what uh, Aunt Sybil said. She said, Daddy was hard. He grew up, I mean, he was just hard. He said, but, and he didn't tell us he loved us much. But here's how I knew he loved us. I knew how he loved us by the way he treated our children, which was his grandchildren. I mean, this, the grandchildren, I mean, by this age, he's gotten softer. And the grandchildren, he adored his grandchildren. And he doted over them. He loved them. He played with them. He picked on them. He messed with them. He told them stories. I mean, I remember sleeping in the bed, me on one side and my cousin Wendy on the other, and he's telling us stories before we go to sleep. And we had a marvelous relationship with Lewis Jones. Wow. And this is the children. My dad's on the far end. He's the youngest. And right beside him is my Uncle J.C. He was the oldest, right, that retired from the Air Force, right? And this is just some of the fruit of that union between Mamie and Lewis Jones through the years. Isn't that interesting? Now throw up that next picture, if you will. Here's my dad, though. Within a few weeks before his death, he died in the fall of, of 2022. And I throw up this picture to just, I'm being honest with you this one. Can I be honest? Can I be honest with you? Can I be real? I'm like, Lord, what's, what's keeping me from receiving like you want me to receive, Right? And, and you look at a whole family line, like what I just showed you, there's some in that family that had no problem receiving. Like my Uncle J.C., he was blessed. In fact, it seemed like the oldest four, 
had no problem receiving the blessing of the Lord on their life, particularly as it related, relates to finances. But the youngest two, they struggled their whole life, including my dad. He basically struggled his, his whole life. I mean, he went to Bible college, he pursued ministry, but it was like, man, there was just never enough in our household, just never quite enough, right? And I grew up living that way. I remember my, mom, my dad flipped out when my mom spent $100 at the grocery store one week right? You can't buy three bags of something without $100 these days. But it, I, 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 it was just a lot of money. And it was always this struggle, this struggle, this struggle, right? Listen, my dad goes in ministry. But when I'm 13 years old, my dad is pastoring a church in Greene County. And he has an affair with a woman, a, a woman in the church. And he chooses to leave his family and he marries her. And she's got two of her own children, right? I'm just being honest with you and real, right? And at 13 years old, I felt real abandonment from my father for the first time in my life. I mean, real solid abandonment. And it never got better. So at 13, which is the most formidable, formidable age in one's life, teen years, right? My foundation just came all apart. And thank God for my mother. She's teaching the littles this morning. Thank God for my mother, right? I mean, she grabbed herself up by her bootstraps with the help of God, and she provided for the three of us, my, my brother and my sister, and she did a, an amazing job with that, right? But listen, all through the years, as bad or as much as I wanted a relationship with my dad, I, could, I, I never had it. And even about the time I thought I was getting close to a real connection with him, something would come in and just rip it all apart. And, and I can just, I'm just being honest with you. The man threw me under the bus so many times and abandoned me over and over and over in my life. It happened multiple times to the point where I can be honest with you today and tell you that it literally put scars in my heart that I wish I could tell you I was over. But it's obvious to me I'm still caring to this day. Now, you know, I showed you the picture of John Washington Jones and the boys. Listen, and Lewis was missing from the picture. He was in the Army. There was a valid reason for it, right? But from the family research I've done, talking to family members, uh, uncles and aunts, right? Listen, there was a rift in the family. And not only was Lewis not in the picture, he really wasn't in the picture. Somehow along the way, John, Washington, Jones, and Lewis, there was an abrasion. And, and the other sons, they went off and did different things in their careers and in their lives. But Lewis was a farmer. He'd grown up with a farmer as a dad, and he wanted to farm, right? And when he died, he thought he was getting the farm. The daughter got the farm. Lewis didn't get the farm. The farm was right, out, right off of uh, Cobb Road, uh, Gum Swamp Road, uh, uh, outside of it. He didn't get the farm. And listen, it hurt my grandfather. I'm pretty sure it devastated him. And you know what happened? Listen, he was a sharecropper his whole life. A sharecropper means you are a farmer, but you don't own anything. You're renting the farmland. You take a percentage of your crops, and you're sharing them with the property owner. Listen, the man never owned a home. My grandfather, as good as he was, loved his grandchildren. He was a good man. He was saved, right? But he never owned a home. He never owned a farm. When he died, he died in a rental house. That's where he died. And you could say, in essence, the same thing happened with my dad and my Uncle Mac. And my Uncle Mac was a good man. But for the other four, it seemed like that thing didn't hit them. And I can't tell you why and how some of this stuff lands and where it lands and how it lands, but there are generational things that can happen in our lives. Listen, and it's called an iniquity. There's sin that's missing the mark. There's transgression that's doing what you know you shouldn't do, but you do it anyway. But then there's iniquity. And iniquity is oftentimes generational things that get handed down from one to the other to the other to the other. It's just it's the way it's been. Right before my dad died, I'd written that book in 2022. I went to see him. And that, that picture, that, that throw that back up, that picture right there was the picture of the day that I, I had the books in my hand and I'd given a copy of that book to just dear people in my life. I had one for every one of the children, and I wrote something in, in it for them, and I wrote something in the book for my dad, and we're holding to the left a picture of my grandmother and my granddaddy. I would definitely connect my spiritual inheritance to my grandmother right there, Lewis Jones's wife, right? And I'm just, I'm blessing my dad with this book, and, and I wanted to get a picture of us together with that picture. 
And listen, he's a few weeks from dying. Um, then I went by to see him a few more times before he passed away. And on one of these visits, like his, his mind almost went to a childlike state. He had a brain tumor. His, uh, his mind almost went to this childlike state to a degree. He was softer. He was kinder. He was sweeter than I'd ever known him to be. And I remember this one time I went to visit, and it was really the last time I went to visit him where he was any semblance of himself. I visited him for a bit, and I'm about to leave. It's time for me to go, and I'm making my way to the door. <laughs> my dad got up, and he just gets up off the chair, and he comes over there to the door. I'm, I'm, I'm getting on my, I, I had a motorcycle. I'm getting back on my motorcycle to go, and he comes, and he just stands at the door. And he's looking in that glass door. And it was almost like he could. He was saying without being able to say, please don't leave. There's some things I want to say to you, but I don't have the ability to say them. And so I walked back up on the porch. It was just one of those odd moments. Like I knew I had to go, but I knew that the spirit on the inside of him, his spirit man, had some things he wanted to say to me, but he didn't have the ability to say it. It was just one of those moments. And so we left and we departed and, a few months later, we're, he's gone. He's gone. Now listen, I'm just telling you what I feel like the Lord's shown me with that. This father wound that I've had in my life. I'm, 50, I'm about to be 57 years old. This father wound in my life has somehow kept me from being able to receive from my heavenly father. And he has shown up more times than I'd love to admit to you. But here's what I do know. God wants to break it free. He wants to break it free. And here's what the Lord told me this week. He said, you've got faith to come out like Egypt. They could come out of Egypt, the Israelites. They came out of Egypt, but they didn't have the faith to go in. Maybe you had the faith to get your sins forgiven and get saved and your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but you don't have the faith to walk into the promised land and the blessing of God on your life, and you don't even know why, but something keeps holding you back. Every time you get to the threshold of the river, something keeps holding you back. Here's what I'm telling you today. You ready? God wants to break that off of your life. And you can get so used to that that you learn to live with it and you settle with it and it just becomes your lot and you get to where you don't even really think about it anymore. It just took that come home to Jesus talk Wednesday night where my wife said, baby, something's got to break here. Like, what's going on? I'm like, I honestly don't know what's going on, but I'm going to find out. And I pulled away and got from God, got with God. Listen to this. Grasshoppers, here's what they can be, the grasshopper. They can be wounds. They can be scars. They can be hurts. They can be besetting sins. All designed by the adversary to keep us out of the promised rest. But here's what you got to know. Listen, that's not God's will for your life. He wants that broken off of you. So I said, Lord, how do I, how do I break this? And he gave this to me. He said, you got to deal with the grasshopper. And listen, you think a grasshopper, it can be no big deal. When grasshoppers form together, they become locusts. That's, what, that's the below, they're grasshoppers. And they literally can bring devastation to an area. I looked up grasshoppers. I did some research on them. And they eat, and you know what it says in Wikipedia? It says they eat pasture. They eat pasture. Whoa. And the, immediately the Lord reminded me of the verse. David said this. He wrote this. He said, you lead me beside still waters. He said, you lead me to green pastures and you restore my soul. God's trying to lead us to green pastures, but listen, the locust is trying to eat it. Listen, and if you don't deal with the locust, singular, the locusts become plural, and they become, they become invasive, evasive. The grasshopper becomes a locust, and it's literally designed to just completely eat away and destroy. But here's what you got to do. You ready? The Lord gave me this this week, and I'm giving this to you. He said, you got to give it the one, two, punch. I'm not trying to be cute. This is what he said to me. He said, you got to give it the one, two, punch. He says, number one is this. You got to recognize it. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad today. I'm not trying to get you to look at yourself. We're going to get our eyes on Jesus. But here's number one, though. You ready? You got to recognize it. 
you got to recognize that this is really going on. This is really happening. Like, I can't, I can't play with this. I can't deny this. I can't act like it doesn't exist. i got to recognize this for what it is. Because Jesus says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's got something very specific he's using to kill, steal, and destroy you with. And you got to recognize it. You've got to recognize it. David said this. He said, Lord, search my heart and reveal if there be any wicked way in me. Search my heart, Lord. Search my heart. I did some heart searching this week. And the Holy Spirit is so good at this. And when God does it, listen, he does it without condemnation. Without condemnation. But he wants to bring it to the surface so that we recognize it, right? He wants us to recognize it. And then here's what he gave me. And this man, he recognized. He's the Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief. He recognized it. And here's the second punch. You ready? He said, recognize, number one. And number two is radical obedience. Radical obedience. And this is what I get from this. Do whatever he tells you to do. Do whatever he tells you to do. You with me? I, I, I kept thinking. I, I can't tell you how many times I can't remember where I put my keys on my AirPod or, or whatever, right? And I'll pray. I have faith for this. Lord, show me where, the, where that is. And he will literally show me. He'll show me what pants pocket I left it in, what short pair of shorts pocket. I left. Like he shows me all the time this happens, right? Here's what he said to me. Son, don't you know that if I'll show you where your keys are or your AirPod, that I'll show you this. I'm not going to keep this from you. I'm not going to keep this from you. So recognize it. Listen. And here's what James says. When we ask God for wisdom, he'll give it to us liberally and without condemnation. He'll give us the wisdom. What's wisdom? It's the path. It's the answer. It's the direction. It's the directive, right? So listen, but here's what that requires on our part is radical obedience. When God gives it to you, you got to be able to, uh, uh, you got to be willing to do whatever he tells you to do. You got to be willing to do it. Wow. It says, and when he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And so he said to them, this kind, this kind. This ain't like the other kinds. This kind, <laughs> this kind, this kind. That's recognition. This kind comes out only by nothing but prayer and fasting. Wow. Prayer, you ready? Prayer. Oh, Lord, help me. I'm sorry, that ain't going to cut it. Prayer is pressing in. Prayer is seeking God. It is beseeching God, right? And here's how Paul says I do it. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, here's how I pray. This is, it, would, would it be safe to pray like Paul? He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Would, we, would, we, would that be safe for us? Here's how Paul says he prays. You ready? In 1 Corinthians 14, 15, he says, so what shall I do? Because he talked about struggles in his own life. He was honest and open. He was transparent. He said, so what shall I do? He said, I will pray with my spirit, and but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I'll, I will also sing with my understanding. Wow. Praying in your spirit is praying in the spirit is not praying in your understanding. Paul says in this same chapter, when, I pray, uh, when I'm praying in my understanding, my mind is fruitful. But when I pray in the Spirit, my mind is not fruitful. I don't even know what I'm praying. He said, but the Spirit of God is praying through me because I'm doing that by faith. Wow. You know what the Lord's been telling me lately? This, I'm, not, I'm serious. I've been hearing this lately, and it goes right in with, with what I got Thursday. He says, I want you to pray in the Spirit more. I want you to press in and spend more time deliberately praying in the Spirit. Be intentional about praying in the Spirit. Romans 8, 26 in the Amplified. This is why this is so important. And I don't care if your tradition didn't tell you about this, right? It's God's Word. Here's what he says right here in Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit comes to us and helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray, to offer, or how to offer it as we should. I don't know how to, if I'd have known how to pray about this thing already, I would have. He said, but the Spirit, capital S, himself, knows our need and at the right time intercedes in our behalf with sighs and groanings too deep for words. One version of this says, with, with, with unintelligible intellectual words. Wow. 
So here's the first thing we do. We pray. We pray. We pray. And then here's fasting. Fasting. Now listen, people like to make fasting easy. Fasting ain't easy. It's not easy at all. It's uncomfortable. Your flesh will resist it. Your flesh won't like it. But it is powerful, and it is a powerful weapon that God has given us as believers for breakthrough. And this story demonstrates it. Fasting means you, you just pull away. Here's what happens when you fast. You're saying, you're saying this. When I'm fasting, this is what you're saying when you're fasting. I'm pulling away from food and pleasurable things to get with God because I'm not going to feed right now my flesh man and my soul man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed my spirit man. And, and, and let me tell you what will motivate you to fast. You ready? When the thing you're believing God for, if you've recognized it, if you don't have your head buried in the sand and you're in denial, but if you've recognized it, when the desire for that thing to be eliminated from your life is greater than your desire for food, you won't mind fasting. You won't mind fasting. Fasting means you pull away. Isaiah 58, 6 says this, Is this not the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. That's the result of fasting. When you pull away and you get away and you push away from things that, that are a distraction to you, you get off social media, you get off this, you get off that, and you get along with God and you, you skip some meals, maybe a day, maybe a meal, maybe a few days, whatever the Lord leads you to do. Listen, here's the result of that. Bonds get loosed. Bonds of wickedness get loosed. Heavy burdens get taken away. The oppressed go, through, go free. And every yoke gets broken in Jesus' name. That's a promise from the Lord. And you know what? I was in here Saturday. I went home uh, Friday night. But Saturday, I'm in here doing some stuff. I got in here early that morning. And you know what the Lord said to me? He said, listen, I'm calling my people to even more than fasting. I'm calling people to a fasted way of life, a fasted lifestyle. This is next level. A fasted lifestyle simply says this, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm not letting anything in my life, listen, that would hurt my walk or my witness nothing that would hurt my walk listen or my witness and you just make a determination by the help of the holy spirit and can i be honest with you it's going to take some fasting to do that because when we fast our spirit man is built up listen when we focus on feeding our body and our flesh our soul man is built up but god's wanting to do something radical and I really believe he's calling people to a fasted lifestyle. I'm saying this in closing. Listen to this. Listen to this. I, I just see prophetically the picture of what I believe God is doing. This is what he was saying to me yesterday. God is raising up some special forces. Now, I was in the Marine Corps, but I'm going to use Army terminology with you here for a moment. You ready? Here's Army terminology. I was in the Civil Air Patrol in high school, and we went to Fort Bragg once, and they took us on an outing to go repelling. And the people that were hosting us were special forces. They were Green Berets. And they were all around. They were showing us how to repel off this tower, and it was really neat. But I'm pretty observant. I'm pretty observant. I'm pretty intuitive. And I was noticing these guys, and they just looked different than the regular Army. And in, in, in the Army, you have regular Army. This is what you have. You have regular Army. You have Airborne. You'll have uh, uh, air, an airborne division, like 82nd Airborne or 101st Airborne. Within them, you have the Rangers. From the Rangers, you have the Green Beret. And from the Green Beret, you have the Delta Forces. And, and this is just kind of the flow, right? And, and listen, the higher you get up that thing, the less people there are. The less people there are. Right? It gets just fewer and fewer and fewer, right? But here's what I noticed then, those years ago, and it stuck with me for, through the years. These special forces guys, they're, they're known as operators. And they carry themselves with a quiet confidence. They don't, they don't wear a T-shirt that says, I'm a Green Beret. 
they wear a green beret when they're in uniform, right? But they don't have to. They walk in this quiet confidence because they know who they are. And they walk, they walk with this, and, and it's, just, it's like they, they, they've got a swag about them. It's not boastful, it's not proud, it's not, hey, look at me, right? It's just what it is. It's interesting. Will over here is in the Marine Corps, and he works in the Army. He fixes weapons, right? And he's assigned to work with the special operators in the Marine Corps. Listen, here's what's interesting. That, that's known as the Marine Corps, the, by mass, is known as the Fleet Marine Force, right? You go to Camp Lejeune, and they're everywhere, right? But he works in an area that's different from the rest. It's at an area called Stone Bay. It's a small little detachment. And he serves these special operators, Marine Corps Recon. They're called, it's called MARSOC. They're special operators. They're like the Green Beret of the Marine Corps, right? And Will would tell you, they get, they're just different. Like, like they don't have to have anything on them that says, I'm the Green Beret, but you can spot them from a mile away if you're used to seeing them and you've been around them. You just, you just, you just know who they are. Listen, here's what the Lord said to me. I, I'm just, and this message ain't for everybody. This ain't for everybody. But I feel like the Lord said to me this weekend, listen, I want to raise up some special operators and special forces in the kingdom of God. And I'm putting out the call. I'm putting out the call. Jesus says this, many are called, but few are chosen. The word chosen means answer the call. And listen, to be a special operator in the kingdom of God means you're going to be a little different. Your determination is different. I mean, what they go through, the Navy SEALs, the, 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 the green bread, what they go through is, it, it is, it is, it's not like everybody else. And I'm not trying to be religious or weird, but I felt this calling. This is what God's saying. Listen, this is my desire even for this, this group right here. The Lord told me uh, in 2022, I want you to plant these fish bowls. I believe there are 12 areas around the country, but we're going to plant a harbor house just like this. And you know what he said to me this week? He says, these places are fobs. They're forward operating bases. In, in Afghanistan, we would send a group of army rangers into a fob, and it's deep behind enemy lines, and they would set up this, this little forward operating base, and from that base, they would go out and conduct operations. And you know what they would do? They would go out on patrol. They would go into the village of these Afghanis, and they would try to win the hearts and minds of the people so that they would trust the Americans and not the Taliban, right? And this is what I heard him say. He said, these things right here, he said, these are fobs. And I'm going to put some in strategic areas, and I'm going to fill them with some special forces, some operators. You know how special forces people refer to one another? As team members and teammates. Wow. Wow. Team members and teammates. God is calling us to operate in the kingdom of God. And I don't care if I look different from everybody else. I don't care if I'm not, I, I, I honestly don't even want a big crowd. I'm not looking for a big crowd. I'm just looking for some special operators because I feel like this is what God's called us to, that he's going to drop us in some areas behind enemy lines, some fobs, some forward operating bases. Listen, and we're going to bring the kingdom of God in some dark places. And it goes right to the verses that he called me in the scripture with back in 1999. He says, enlarge the place of your tent, Isaiah 54, 2 through 4, 2 through 6. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Stretch out to the right and stretch out to the left. For your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid. Do not be ashamed. You will not suffer shame or be humiliated. For your God is the God of Israel, the God of all the earth. That's special operations. I didn't understand it then, but I'm understanding it more. Amen. This is the call. This is the call. So I just want to say this morning, listen, as we're closing, and we've gone long. I pray, Lord, please don't help me be long. Boy, we're long. It's okay, though. It's okay. This is a fob. You ain't like the regulars. And I'm not saying we're special than anybody else or someone else. You need the regulars. If everybody, everybody can't be a, a special operator. You got to have the fleet. You got to have the regular army, right? But there's a call to some to be a special operator. Listen, and to be a special operator. Here's what they learn to do. You know what they learn to do, these special operators? They learn how to master their flesh. They've mastered it. They've mastered it. Here, so when they feel like they can't go one more step, they go five more steps. They've learned how to master their flesh. Paul says this. He says this. He says, all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. 
He says, I won't let anything have mastery over my flesh. This is the call. Not everybody's going to answer, all right? But if you feel it in your heart, you might want to say, Lord, I'm going to answer that. This is what you. This is why I am different. This is why I've been different my whole life. Amen? But listen, you just get radical. And you say, Lord, I'm cutting out anything that would hurt my walk or my witness. I'm cutting that out of my life. I don't want that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let anything have mastery over me. Amen? And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to follow you in radical obedience to do whatever it takes in the kingdom of God. Amen? What else you going to do? I got, I'm 57. What have I got? 40 years left? 50 years? I'm 50, I'd be 107. What about, like, what else am I going to do? Amen? When this is over, it's over. Amen? When it's over for you, it's over. Listen, here's what you want. You want to stand before the Lord and him say, hey, you did exactly what I put you on earth to do. Here's your crown. And you say, thank you, Lord, and I just worship you with it anyway at every step. That's what you want to do. Amen? In Jesus' name. Listen, there's a call. There's a call. Listen, here's the call. Listen, with the help of the Lord, kill the grasshopper in your life. That's call number one. But listen, within that call, there's a call for some of you to be special operators in the kingdom of God. That's what you're going to have to gain mastery over your flesh. You got to break everything that would hold you back. And here's how you do it. You do it through prayer and fasting. And not just a fast every now and then. You live a fasted life. If the Lord tells you not to eat that meal, then you don't eat it. You spend that time in prayer, reading God's word. You're connecting with him. Radical obedience. Radical obedience in Jesus' name. Let's stand our feet as we close. Grab your communion cup, if you will. Hallelujah. This is start with the first one. Listen, start with the first one. And that's any grasshopper in your life that's been holding you back. You start right there today in Jesus' name. Listen, you can't, you can't move on to the next thing until you, do with, you deal with that one. Some of you, have, as I've been talking this morning, you, you've already recognized. You know, you know what the grasshopper is in your life. And listen, maybe there's two or three. You know the grasshoppers. You, you, you already know. But here's what I want you to know this morning. Listen, deliverance is part of your salvation package. God wants you saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, and made prosperous. And listen, it's high up in his order. Deliverance is one of the first three in God's priority. He wants you saved, he wants you healed, and he wants you delivered. See, I've had faith for healing for a long time. I really believe if I can get my hands on you and pray the prayer of faith, you got a good chance of being healed. And I've seen it happen over and over and over. But you know what? I've struggled with receiving. God's breaking that off of me in Jesus' name. And listen, you're going to see it. You're going to see it in Jesus' name. I'm going public with it. Amen. Whatever the grasshopper is today, believe that you receive and walk in this. Commit yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit to be radically obedient, recognizing to be radically obedient, to walk in the victory that Jesus died to give you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the bread and the cup this morning. By faith in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, listen to this. I came up here, and I didn't even know when I was going to leave. I was prepared to spend three nights in this place. I was going to stay through tomorrow, to the last night. I ain't no joke. This is, God knows what he's doing. I'm now laying on this row right here, just watching a sermon, watching a video, digging deep in God's word. And I just started crying, and it had nothing to do with my sermon that I was watching. But I heard the Holy Spirit say, because I told my wife Wednesday night, I said, baby, I don't know what this is, but there's going to be breakthrough and a turnaround really quick because I'm pressing in. And I said, Lord, I'm going up into that building, and I'm, I'm just, I'm not coming out to this breakthrough. Like, I need breakthrough. I'm laying right over there, and I'm watching this sermon, and I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, hey, you've received the breakthrough. You've received it. And tears started rushing down my face. Like it was the Holy Spirit. I mean, he came all over me. He said, you've received what you came for. That thing's broken off your life. Now, I'm going to see the manifestation of it, right? I believe it's already started in Jesus' name. Amen. And then within seconds, I get a text. And it was from Scott. It's been Scott Sunday for some reason. 
It was a text from Scott. Listen, and here's what Scott said. He was operating in a gift of the Spirit called the Word of Knowledge, and immediately he sent me a text. He said, hey, man, I know you're up there in the building meditating. The only reason he knew is because I didn't want him to come in here for a couple of days. He's been in here doing work. I said, Scott, if you don't mind, just uh, I'm going to be up here for a day or so. So he sends me a text. He said, hey, I know you're meditating and spending time with the Lord, but I just heard the word breakthrough and deliverance, and I had to tell you that within seconds of me hearing that, right? Listen, it don't take a whole lot. It just takes enough, amen? And it starts with your willingness to do whatever it takes to be free from that grasshopper in Jesus' name. And if that's your attitude, I promise you, he whose son sets free will be free indeed in Jesus' name, amen? So listen, with the bread and the cup, let's believe that we receive today. In Jesus' name, by faith, believe that you receive. Turn your intellectual mind off for a minute and get it in your spirit that you receive what Jesus did for you on that cross 2,000 years ago. Come with childlike faith. We're trying to figure it all out. With childlike faith in Jesus' name. You ready? Say this with me and believe it in your heart. Father, I thank you today for salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your son, I declare today Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, you are my Deliverer. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, I am free and delivered. In Jesus' name, I kill every grasshopper in my life. Anything that's stopping me from moving into this place of rest, I declare it killed. In Jesus' name. I receive by faith deliverance and breakthrough in Jesus' name. Amen. I receive that. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Mm. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you. Listen, somebody's being healed and delivered of anxiety in Jesus' name. And depression in Jesus' name. Depression and anxiety, you're being delivered in Jesus' name. Chronic pain. Chronic pain, just pain in your body. The Lord is delivered. That's a besetting spirit. That goes beyond medical care. Doctors can't even figure out why you got it. And you've been dealing with it. That is broken off of you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, 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 listen. There's a breaking free from pornography in Jesus' name. I mean a breaking free. As you recognize and are radically be, I mean the spirit of the breakers here right now. But I'm telling you right now, as you are radically obedient to what God tells you, you're going to live a free life in Jesus' name. And you must receive that right now by faith in Jesus' name. Toxicity. There's a toxicity that someone walks in. It's like this toxic. You can never rest. There always has to be some drama. There's something. God's breaking that off of you in Jesus' name. Amen. And you are resting in the peace of Almighty God in Jesus' name. We break financial lack off of anyone here today, anyone watching in Jesus' name. We break the stronghold of financial lack in Jesus' name. And I hear this so strong and the fear of man. We break off the fear of man in Jesus' name. We don't care what anybody thinks in Jesus' name. We break off the fear of man in the name of Jesus Christ. Receive that. And I receive that for myself. We receive that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And listen, that was just, I, I felt the Holy Spirit give me that. If you didn't get something called out, believe God that you receive it. Depression gone now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And Father, we give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. Father, as we go our way today, bless us and keep us. May your face shine upon us. May you grant us your peace and safety and blessing and favor as we go over ourselves, our loved ones, and our families. Return us safely together in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus' name. Amen.